Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Dame Anne Glover and I'm the president of the Royal Society of Edinburgh, Scotland's National Academy. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you to our annual joint lecture between the Royal Academy of Engineering and the Royal Society of Edinburgh. And indeed, this is our first online uh, webinar. First, let me tell you a little bit about the RSE, the Royal Society of Edinburgh. We are Scotland's National Academy and we were founded in 1783. And our fellowship represents about 1600 people who are notable for their excellence of contribution in Scotland or to Scottish life um, across a broad range of areas. And that includes business, public life, the creative arts, and of course, academia. And in academia, science, engineering, and the arts. So across the whole spectrum of research. Now our strap line at the RSE is knowledge made useful. And what we want to do at the RSE is to harness that knowledge to make modern Scotland the best it can be. And we're here for all of the people of Scotland. And in harnessing that knowledge, our purpose is to improve life in Scotland and indeed make our contribution in that sense to the rest of the world. Today's event is, is uh, organized in partnership with the Royal Academy of Engineering, and it's all about bringing space down to earth. So very appropriate that this is our first online annual lecture. Now, we all know about space technology and probably the most common thing that we'll think about is navigation uh, using space technology. But space technology is used all the time on Earth for a whole number of purposes. We know a lot about climate change because of our use of space technology. But we can also do things such as monitor water levels on Earth. We can look at soil erosion. And indeed, we can even track ships as they sail across the ocean and identify whether they're discharging bilge water or not. So there's always an eye on you from space. Uh, these days. So an exciting event to look forward to, but I'd like to tell you a little bit about how the event will be organised. So first of all, uh, when I finish speaking, I'm going to hand over to the President of the Royal Academy of Engineering, Professor Sir Jim MacDonald, who will also make an introduction to you. After that, we're going to hear from our four speakers today and they've done a pre-record uh, introduction to the area that they work in. And then after that has finished, we're going to have a panel Q&A. Now, at that point, as attendees, you can send in questions and there should be a tab at the bottom of your screen that says Q&A. And if you put your question there, say who you are, then I will try to include as many of those questions as possible for the panel. Uh, then we expect our event to end at about 10 past three. And just before it ends, uh, I'll come back to you and make a few summarizing remarks. So that's the plan for today's uh, 2020 Royal Society of Edinburgh, Royal Academy, Academy of Engineering joint lecture. And now it's my great pleasure to hand over to Professor Sir Jim MacDonald, President of the Royal Academy of Engineering. Jim. Thank you very much, Anne, and uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you're all keeping safe and well, given the strange circumstances we're in. But nonetheless, it allows us to innovate, as Anne has said, uh, a meeting such as this. Uh, you've heard from Dame Anne that uh, I have the privilege of being president of the Royal Academy of Engineering, and we're absolutely delighted to be co-hosting this with our friends at the Royal Society of Edinburgh. And I should say, Anne, uh, many thanks to you and your staff, because it's the RSC that have made all of the arrangements uh, for today's meeting, and uh, a great uh, appreciation from all colleagues at the Royal Academy of Engineering for all of that. Uh, the RENG is the UK's National Academy for Engineering and Technology, and it's a charity. 
And very importantly, we seek to harness the power of engineering to build a sustainable society and an inclusive economy that works for everyone. And this is, in effect, what we would say is engineering in the service of society. In collaboration with our fellows, uh, interesting similarity with the RSE, about 1,600 fantastic engineering fellows and our partners. Our work covers three principal areas of activity. Firstly, growing talent and developing skills for the future. We've got programs that support chairs in emerging technologies, such as our colleague and friend Colin, who's uh, a part of the panel today, research fellows, uh, industrial fellowships and professorships. The second area is around driving innovation and building global partnerships. Uh, and the UK in particular and the Scottish engineering community is worthwhile singling out, has a massive impact, not only at home, but across the globe. And the Academy of Engineering seeks to drive all of that through support and connectivity with our sister academies around the world. And last but not least, is the influencing of policy and engaging the public. And more recently, we've established the National Engineering Policy Centre. And because of the challenges that we face just now, NEPCs, it's known as very strongly engaged with the UK government, SAGE, and the Committee of the Council for Science and Technology, where engineering and technology is now getting a pathway to making a difference to our lives immediately, as well as for long-term policy making. But of course, engineering, impacts our daily lives and addresses some of the greatest challenges that we face as a society. But it very often goes unrecognized and space is a good example of that. We have just marked the 30th anniversary of the Hubble telescope being launched into space on, the, on board the shuttle Discovery. Uh, the scientific vision behind that project was incredible, but it was an extraordinary international effort of engineering excellence that put that machine into space to realize its mission to probe the farthest and faintest reaches of the cosmos, free of the distortion of the Earth's atmosphere. And the engineering innovation, of course, continues today. Hubble's engineers have figured out a way that the telescope can continue to observe the universe on only one gyro, using other types of sensors on the spacecraft to make up for the fact that the gyros or some of the gyros have failed. The Apollo program that all of us recognize uh, was beyond doubt the most audacious engineering project of the last century with its goal to land humans on another world. It employed nearly half a million people, cost over $25 billion, and inspired people from all over the world to take up careers in engineering and science. Truly inspirational. But the Apollo program had an even greater legacy. It underpinned the satellite systems that we take for granted today. Systems that are central to modern communications as Dayman has mentioned, navigation and surveillance, both civil and military. But engineering provides solutions to some of the world's greatest problems, and the grand challenge of space exploration is now a terrific commercial reality, as well as facilitating scientific observation. We've seen in the last few weeks SpaceX launching the initial satellites to provide its Starlink satellite broadband. But the concept and technology behind such mega constellations of small satellites were pioneered here in the UK by Surrey Satellite Technology over 30 years ago. Their work helped us to make space accessible, not just the preserve of superpowers. And the UK space economy now supports 42,000 jobs and contributes over five billion pounds to our GDP. And I'm delighted to say Scotland is a hot spot of this success. Almost a fifth of those UK space jobs are in Scotland. More satellites are made in Glasgow than in any other city in Europe. And Highlands and Islands Enterprise are developing exciting plans for a vertical launch capability in Sutherland. So I'm absolutely delighted to be working with Anne today in this co-delivered lecture. And I'm delighted that we have with us some of our leading Scottish space innovators and business leaders to tell us a little bit more about their work and the future of the space industry. Uh, so there's good reason to hold this event. And, and do forgive me, but I'm bound to say it, it is Star Wars Day. So may the 4th be with you. Uh, or is that May the 4th? Uh, as we enjoy some of uh, this fantastic uh, presentation from our colleagues. So with that, uh, I'll stop and invite you now to watch the following clips from our speakers before we lead on to the live Q&A. Thank you very much indeed.
Uh, I'm Colin McInnes uh, from the James Watt School of Engineering at the University of Glasgow. The University of Glasgow is engaged in a broad range of space research from astronomy and space science through planetary science to space technology. And within the School of Engineering, our work is delivered through the Space and Exploration Technology Group. Here we cover access to space, that's launch vehicles, space technologies, spacecraft orbits, then re-entry, descent and landing, and work on planetary exploration technologies such as drilling and coring. At present, my own team is working on space technologies at extremes of length scale, from the, the, the very small to the very large, supported by a Royal Academy of Engineering Chair in Emerging Technologies. This invest includes investigating uh, how small we can make functional spacecraft. And for example, we're developing a tiny three by three centimeter device, which can be used to enable large swarms of sensors to underpin the new satellite applications of the future. Uh, for example, large scale distributed sensing for the space environment. And at the other extreme, we're investigating in our manufacturing technologies for space, such as adapting 3D printing, to enable the fabrication of ultra-lightweight structures directly in orbit. Uh, for example, uh, structures which don't have to be packed for launch and then unfolded in space. We're also working on strategies to access resources from near-Earth asteroids, which could underpin a range of future large-scale space ventures. I think it's key that we pursue such work on emerging space technologies for the future. Many of the satellite applications used today, satellite navigation, global telecommunications, and environmental monitoring from space are built on decades of space technology development. So if you want to address both the immense opportunities and the challenges of the future, then Scotland needs to be at the forefront of new thinking in space. Thanks for your attention. I am Pam Anderson. I am the Head of Institutional Engagement at AEC Cloud Space in Glasgow. AEC Cloud Space provide turnkey solutions and services, all the way from mission design to on-orbit operations, including satellite platforms in the range from 1 to 50 kilograms, as well as a full range of satellite subsystems. For over a decade, AEC Cloud Space have been developing commercial solutions and space-based capabilities across a range of applications, including communications, earth observation and science missions. Our complete end-to-end -end mission service package covers everything from mission and payload design all the way through to satellite operations to allow our customers to concentrate on their business delivery. And we have a broad range of customers across government, commercial and educational organisations around the world. My job specifically involves engaging with space agencies like the European Space Agency and the UK Space Agency to generate proposals for funding to allow us to perform future technology development. And it's also my responsibility to work with universities to understand their research and development activities and form collaborations to allow these developments to feed into our technology roadmaps. My background is in mechanical and aerospace engineering and I have a PhD from Strathclyde University in orbital dynamics. I've had various roles over the course of my career to date, including recently working with the European Space Agency Business Applications Regional Ambassador Platform Network in the UK before joining AAC Clyde Space. I also have a real passion for STEM education and outreach, um, and I'm really keen to support the next generation of engineers and scientists working in the space industry in Scotland. Thank you. Hi, I'm Malcolm McDonald, and I work at the University of Strathclyde, where we've got one of the largest space engineering research activities in Europe. At Strathclyde, we seek to make a positive difference to both society and to our communities, both locally and around the world. For the last six years, Strathclyde has hosted and I've been leading the Scottish Centre of Excellence in Satellite Applications, or SOXA, where we coined the phrase bringing space down to earth to describe the work that we were doing in connecting space with non-space challenge owners and harnessing space as a solution provider and an enabler 
for sustainable, socially inclusive economic impact across our communities. At SOXA, we've helped create at least 16 new businesses in the last five years, addressing challenges such as the development of new financial service products with data collected by satellites to make peer-to-peer -peer trading fairer and easier. We've supported companies addressing challenges around the state, condition, value, and ultimately the sustainability of natural assets. While others have addressed challenges such as assessing the efficiency of our built environment. <laughs> we even combined our research with space-derived intelligence to spin out a company that will help you plan your next big outdoor adventure. In our space research, we're inventing tomorrow, working to develop and apply space systems to challenge conventional ideas and advance new concepts in the exploration and exploitation of space. We're working to develop the techniques required to efficiently operate large constellations of spacecraft, to make space more cooperative and more responsive to our needs. Helping, for example, to increase satellite coverage over disaster areas. We're also working with the Lifeboat Service in the Solway Firth to help improve inshore safety and mapping of safe navigation channels. We're working to develop smart, connected, sustainable fish farms and, you know, we even developed a card game about space exploration to help make space and technology more accessible. We're working to enable and develop space-derived solutions through advancing a range of technologies, often at the interface between different disciplines, often spanning basic research through to applied engineering, through commercialization, road mapping and policy engagement. And in both multinational and locally focused teams. And by doing this, we're combining curiosity-driven research with the development of solutions to answer global challenges. We're making learning and knowledge useful and we're bringing space down to earth. My name is Sarah Minimus and I'm Space Programme Manager at Ecometrica. Um, Ecometrica is a downstream space company. We are headquartered in Edinburgh and with offices in London and Montreal and a global client base. We are in the business of environmental measurement, so we monitor the health of the Earth from space. We take the vast quantities of data available from Earth observation satellites, as well as taking in other types of geospatial data, such as stuff from airborne surveys or drones, and we combine it together via our platform to provide services that provide actionable insights for decision makers. We work with a wide range of different types of organisations. So we work with governments, NGOs, business, all of whom are interested to understand what the environmental impact of their operations are, as well as understanding how they can use natural resources in a more sustainable way. Space data is perhaps traditionally seen as the domain of government or defence organisations, but increasingly we're delivering services to clients who are interested in the operational and strategic insights that Earth observation data can provide. So, for example, we work with a lot of large agribusiness companies who are interested to understand whether their operations are compliant with local environmental regulations. So, for example, commitments to no deforestation in supply chains, but also interested to understand what future risks to the supply of certain crops might be as a result of climate change. I think climate and um, sustainable development are at the core of many new and existing satellite missions at the moment. And for me, it's clear that satellite technology will, will play an important role for both government and business in informing future investments in climate adaptation going forward. Okay, thank you very much indeed to uh, all of our speakers. And um, I, I hope you can now see the speakers and myself uh, on your screen. So please feel free to send in your own questions using that tab at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we've already got one or two questions coming in, but just let, let me kick off, I, I think, some of the questions. We've, we've heard then a lot about space technology potential applications. Um, Colin, I might, I might start with you first. And 
just ask you uh, to try and put on your forward looking goggles and and to tell us a little bit about how how do you think the space sector will have developed in Scotland, say by 2040? So looking forward quite some time. If we look ahead 20 years, then to understand what the space sector could look like, both in Scotland and globally, um, I think we have to look at what's in the lab just now, what's in the kind of R&D stage, which could uh, turn into uh, mature technologies in the future. So we could look at, for example, quantum technologies, uh, machine learning and robotics, um, all of which are technologies which, which Scotland leads in. And we could then see using uh, new classes of sensors to enable new satellite applications, using robotics to assemble um, large space structures, so much larger aperture sensors and antenna for, for communications, uh, and then using machine learning for um, dealing with the, the, the fire hose of data, which even now uh, we see coming from constellations um, of spacecraft. So um, again, I think it's uh, you're looking 20 years in the future, it's really looking at what, what is in the lab just now, what are the exciting technologies which we could see uh, maturing into new space technologies and underpinning uh, new space applications. And again, it's uh, things like you know, quantum technologies, machine learning, uh, robotics are all areas in which, uh, in which Scotland is, is, is leading. So do you see it as a major industry for Scotland, you know, over the next couple of decades? I think the advantage we have here in Scotland is we have potentially the co-location of, uh, of a, a, a launch site in northern Scotland uh, as that develops, uh, satellite manufacturing for, for micro spacecraft, and also companies who are providing data services. So we have all of these pieces together in a fairly compact geographic location, and it's the integration of those which would give us the speed and the agility to respond to the opportunities in the future, which I think that's Scotland's kind of unique selling point globally, is that, that co-location integration of both the launch services, platform manufacturing and data services at the end of the, end of the pipeline. Th thanks, Colin. And I, I, when I'm thinking about that, I mean, uh, Sarah, you've got uh, Ecometrica is, I suppose, split a across a lots of different locations, as you said, but what, from Ecometrica's point of view, what would attract you to Scotland? I mean, why Scotland? People were only five and a half million people. Why, why here? I, th I think it's really a, a combination of things. And I think Colin probably touched on a few of them. Um, I think Scotland has a real depth and breadth of knowledge and skills that really complement the space sector as a whole. So for us, we're kind of right at the end of the data value supply chain, if you like. So we are providing information to end customers who don't necessarily have any sort of remote sensing skills. But it's incredibly important for us to know that but sort of upstream of us in the value chain are really kind of trusted and robust partnerships so Scotland has a history of a sort of innovative and robust engineering sector but similarly there's a huge impetus on data driven innovation at the moment and I think you know Colin touched on it it's that idea of almost like a sort of full mission capability within Scotland and as a as a small country we're incredibly well networked which enables that agility which means we're responsive and able to adapt and actually capture uh, and, and, and launch missions that are for specific user requirements and we're actually adapting to the needs of users, whoever they might be. Yeah, thank you. So, um, and we were talking earlier about the different types of use that you can put space technology to on Earth and, and Malcolm, I was thinking when, when you were talking, so uh, what's the most surprising use of uh, space technology that you've ever come across in, in your time working in this area? I think that's an interesting question. I mean, I think, you know, space is really undervalued. I think the contribution it makes to, to modern life. And I think people really don't quite understand that the scale and dependence that we have on it. And space is a great place for innovation of all sorts in the space sector, but also innovation that can be applied into different parts of the economy and different sectors. Uh, one example which I go back to a lot is the, the use of the, the algorithms to model the parachute descent through um, the, the, of Huygens through Titan's atmosphere. Those same algorithms were then applied to model the flow of crisps through a packing machine to increase the efficiency of that packing machine. Uh, it was another example of algorithms that were used to plan missions to Mars and the Moon. Those same algorithms were then used for online auctions for adverts on websites that have to load 
Um, the, the auction has to complete the time it takes to load the website. So the range of things that, that are available, but you mentioned um, GPS is perhaps the example that you know most people will think of from space, but even there, there's a, a wider range of you know places where GPS is used. It's used in the gearbox of cars and in trucks, so they can be more fuel efficient. They understand the road ahead, they understand the gradient of the road, the curves, and they can make sure the vehicle's in the correct gear coming up to it. So there's such a broad array of things that, that space is used for. Um, and I think all of those are real examples of things that you just wouldn't initially expect to, to have contributions from the space sector. Okay, thank you. And then I, I'm going to go to Pam, but, and then I'm going to go over to a lot of questions that I see coming in from uh, our audience. But um, Pam, just thinking about um, Clyde Space, a small company, but actually with a huge global impact, what do you think that uh, the future holds for small satellite um, applications and services going forward? Yeah, I think so. I think you've cracked it in the in the question there by mentioning global impact, and I think we're going to see an, a real increase around environmental applications and services and using small satellites and the services that you can you can access by having these low cost, effective systems to tackle climate change, which is arguably, you know, the, the biggest challenge globally that we're, we're going to face in the coming years. I think, you know, Sarah's talked a lot about how Ecometrica look at environmental monitoring, and it's obviously something that's been done from space for a long time using larger, traditional, more expensive satellites. And I think if we can harness some of that through technology innovation, through some of the things that, that Colin mentioned, to deliver more efficient services to tackle uh, environmental challenges. I think that's going to be a big area of focus and is a real key strategic area for, for AAC Clyde Space going forward. I think we we all have a responsibility to, to look at how we can better target that. And I think going forward, small satellites could be a, could be a key part of that solution. Okay, Th thanks very much. Right, I, I'm going to have my work cut out here because there's an awful lot of questions coming in. So apologies if, if I don't get to all of those questions. Um, and just a reminder for the panel, if you would like to answer one of these questions, then please stick your hand up and I'll come to you. And uh, more than one of you can answer, of course, but not at the same time. So uh, for, first question I've got coming in that uh, I'm going to share with you is from uh, Siobhan Jordan at Interface. And Siobhan's asking, uh, well, she's saying that it was great to hear about all the varied applications of science technologies and data manipulation uh, in a very broad range of sectors that you've talked about from agribusiness to space odysseys. So um, what Siobhan's asking is, do you have any ideas on how these space technologies could be adapted to support current future uh, current and future medical applications such as coronavirus? which we're, we're currently going through. So um, how could we use space, space technologies to help us address the current pandemic? Any thoughts? Okay, Malcolm, can I mostly, go to you first? Yeah, mostly because nobody else was putting their hand <laughs> up. I thought, oh, I'll give it a go. Um, I think one of the, the interesting things about the pandemic is, you know, some of the stuff we've seen around air quality, particularly in Europe, and the verification of that has come from space. Um, I've always been a bit of a sceptic about human spaceflight, but, you know, one of the real values of human spaceflight is the, the insight it gives us into the human body. Um, and a lot of the, the, the medical insights that we get from space can then be later applied on the ground. Um, but within our research, we do a lot of research on uh, network systems and graph theory and that sort of thing. We've been applying that to the operation of large constellations. But recently we've been looking at how can you then take that through and apply some of those same algorithms we're using to design space systems to the, the contact tracing and to understand the, the networks of people. Um, so as we move on from this uh, current phase that we're in of the lockdown, um, how can we apply some of those algorithms that we've got around community detection and contact detection um, to understand how we might be able to trace 
um, the virus as it moves through the community um, to allow us to get back to some sort of um, reopening of the economy again. So I think there's a, a broad range of things that you'll see coming out of the space sector and you know, the European Space Agency and the UK Space Agency have got a call open just now for anybody with any ideas uh, from using space technology or space data to help with it. Um, the same has been done in Italy. So there's a, there's a lot of range. And, you know, like I was saying, space is a good place to do innovation. It tends to be a lot of very innovative people. So I think, you know, we'll see lots of surprising and unexpected solutions coming through from the space sector. Okay, thank you. Pam, did you want to say something? Yeah, I think Malcolm's kind of highlighted how it could be, how space could be used to tackle the virus. I think there's an element of space around all those supporting services that help us to continue to function while we're in this really strange state. You know, so things like remote learning and, and remote, you know, telemedicine, things like remote diagnostics for conditions that, that aren't COVID-19 are already in place and there's been so much innovation around healthcare and education applications already coming out of the space sector that I think actually this situation just allows us to see where those um, where those applications kind of come into their own now that we're in this um, we're in a time where we really need them but all a lot of these innovations are already ongoing I think there's a company out of the ESA business incubation center that's developing an app that can tell you when your supermarket is or when other places you might need to go is quiet or busy and you can use that to then change your behavior. So I think, as Malcolm said, there's lots of applications around tackling the virus, but also in these supporting industries as well. OK, I'm going to I'm going to. Oh, Sarah, have you got a, a quick one and then I'll move on to the next question? Or, yeah, just a, I think just a quick one to add on what's been said. I think I agree with Pam that it's kind of on the supporting um systems that space can really add some value and also looking at that longer term recovery so if you think about sort of food systems for example and how agriculture will be affected by you know lack of people able to get to farms to harvest and whether there's issues and timings of sowing and actually understanding how that's affected the kind of growing season and how that might affect food security going onwards it's all these things that maybe aren't it, that sort of immediate and immediate response but in terms of the longer term recovery will be really important to understand. Okay thank you and um, Colin I'm going to move on to a question for you now uh, from someone I think you know um, who's just disappeared off my screen okay he, he's uh, Sonali Mohapatra who says hello Colin um, what's your view on the practicality of deployable structures or optics on CubeSats so you might need to tell the audience a little bit about CubeSats first. Sure, well, CubeSats are um, small satellites. It's a, a standard form factor, which is typically maybe kind of 10 by 10 by 30 centimetres or, or, or larger. And uh, Pam from Clyde Space can say much more about CubeSat technology uh, than I can. Um, one of the constraints of small satellites has always been uh, their, their physical size. So for example, if you want to have a camera, using conventional optics then you're limited by the physical size of the of the platform so um if you went to a very high resolution you'd like a large aperture but if you only get a small satellite then that limits you to the the image resolution which should be available um deployable structures in space um are hugely important they're used for a whole range of applications just now for uh, for antennas or for solar panels i think for for sensors for large deployable optical sensors that's potentially transformative for the future because a spacecraft has only has to be a box shape for, to be launched to fit into the fairing of the launch vehicle but once it's in space there's no particular reason it has to keep that geometry so spacecraft which can unfold can reconfigure the geometry can unfold uh, an optical a large aperture optical system and um, can enable your know, ultra high resolution imaging uh, either looking down for terrestrial applications or looking outwards for space-based astronomy. Um, as well as deployable structures, there's always also in-orbit fabrication. So um, one of the research teams in my group at, uh, at Glasgow University, looking at in-orbit fabrication by adapting, for example, 3D printing technologies to be used in space. And again, that opens a whole range of possibilities. So rather than having to um, uh, manufacture uh, an optical system or other structure in the ground, fold it into the small box of the form factor of a spacecraft, uh, launch it into space, and then, fingers crossed, uh, have it reliably unfold in orbit, 
if we can manufacture it directly in space, then again, open, opens up a whole range of possibilities of manufacturing large space structures, but structures which are optimized for the, uh, the space environment. So we can imagine uh, ultra lightweight, almost kind of organic type structures, which are very different from um, what we see just now. Okay, that's interesting. So I, I, I see that as kind of origami packing to launch and then self-assembly once you get up there, a little bit like viruses, which are a, a topic of the moment. Um, what, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to ask, there's an awful lot of questions coming through. So I'm just going to look for the first person to put their hand up to offer to answer, unless it's, it, it's aimed at anyone in particular and then move on. Um, but I've got a question here from Stuart Munro. And he's talking about the broad range of things that are happening in space research on an international basis. So how do we monitor the ethical use of space technology? Does anyone want to have a go at that? Stuart, they're not keen on your question. <laughs> I'll have a go if you want. I mean, I think space has always been uh, it's always had an element of dual use to it. There's always been a military interest in space all the way back to the very early days of rocketry. So there is always that element, uh, you know, and GPS is a, is a military asset as well. But what we're seeing with space is a democratization of it. We're moving away from an era where the, the, super state, the superpowers had a monopoly over access to space. We've moved through, you know, there are over 100, 130, 150 different countries now have spacecraft in orbit. Universities are putting spacecraft in orbit. We're seeing high schools put things into orbit. So more and more people can get into space and there's more and more visibility about what's going on as well and more understanding of what we're doing to the space environment as well. So I think there is always a need with any new technology to, to be sure that we're monitoring the ethical use of it. But at the same time, we're seeing more and more visibility and more transparency of what's happening. So I think that is a good thing and that will ensure that we do keep on top of the, the ethical uses of, of the technology. And uh, I mean, is there such a thing as international space law? And, you know, who's the authority who would... There are, yes, there are lawyers go all the way into space. Um, and it, it, it's, um, it's not an area where there is... Um, a real depth of law, as I understand it. Um, I think a lot of the space law was established during the Cold War, when there was a need for international treaties and, and that sort of thing. So a lot of the, the governing law around space um, is quite dated. And we're seeing some issues with that now as we move again away from nation states participating in space through to um, companies participating in space. And particularly as we move into kind of trying to use the, the resources that are in space rather than taking everything with us into space. You know, like Colin was talking about actually being able to use the assets that are in space, you know, the mining on asteroids and that sort of thing. But then there's all sorts of legal uncertainties there that, that need to be resolved. And part of the, the challenge with space is that it is so global. So we need everybody to agree and getting those international treaties can be a challenge. Okay. And, and now, now a question for, I guess, anyone who's interested on the panel, but um, this is from uh, Charles Cockle, who's asking, uh, where do any of our panelists see Scotland's role in the growing interest in lunar exploration, uh, either robotic or human? Is Scotland well placed to get involved in that? Yeah, Colin. Yeah, just briefly, I, I, again, it's um, if we look at Scotland's expertise in small satellites, then uh, in the same way that we have constellations of satellites around the Earth for, for navigation, communications, Earth observation, then those same small satellite technologies, you know, one can imagine being translated into lunar orbit for providing navigation services, comms and imaging for, for, the, for the moon. So uh, I think that can also combine with Scotland's expertise in, in robotics. Uh, I believe that uh, it makes Scotland uh, well placed to contribute to future um, lunar um, space development. Thank you. And um, I've, I've got a question here, um, which is uh, from an anonymous attendee, but an interesting one. So how much care is taken in terms of constellations of satellites and their potential to interfere with ground-based space research? Uh, you know, telescopes and so on. Um, 
which could be ruined by passing satellites. I mean, this is very much in, in the news at the moment with the launch of multiple uh, communication satellites. So is that something we need to be worried about, observing space from Earth because of the number of satellites? How do we police that? Any thoughts? I feel Pam's well, well positioned to answer this. And you've just nominated Pam, who's agreed to answer it. Pam, thanks. Pam's brilliant at nominating other people to answer it. <laughs> um, yeah, I think, I mean, we, I think we all have a duty to be responsible in our access to space. And that goes to things like regulation about lifetime of satellites post-mission. Um, I think we in the UK have one of the stricter um, sets of regulation around licensing and um, around insurance and things like that. So I actually think um, as the UK Space Agency, they manage that well um, and make sure that everyone is kind of compliant to, the, to those regulations that they say. And it's with regards to frequency filing and licensing, then it's up to each individual country to stipulate their own rules around that. And I think in the UK, we, we do tend to be one of the more stricter uh, countries around those regulations. Yeah, I mean, it is something that I think many of us are wondering about because, you know, on a, a, a nice evening, you can look up and see the International Space Station pass over and so on. And it's kind of worried me slightly that you might look up and see an awful lot of things passing over. And um, in a way, it would make the night sky a bit like the day sky with vapour trails and, and so on. But is, is that going to happen or not, Pam? Um, I mean, I think we... Yeah, we need to be really careful as to the rate that we're going with these mega constellations and, and as I say, be responsible um, about it. I think we're not we're not there yet where we're, you know, a really kind of over polluted space, but we do need the regulation probably to be even tighter than it is now around around deorbit and things. And that's certainly something that um with the low earth orbit constellations that we've seen most of our customers looking to develop you know the lifetime is is still reasonably short for for small satellites in, in low earth orbit that we're not kind of throwing things up there to to last a lifetime and and become you know uncontrolled space junk so i think we've just got to comply with the regulation to avoid getting to a scenario where that that is the case OK, I'm, I'm going to move on then to a slightly different type of question. So this is from Anne Goldie. And Anne says, where would you go to study aerospace engineering? I think I can tell who's going to say what on the panel, but um, and what experience could I get whilst I'm at school? And thinking about that question, there's another one from Ross Donaldson. Um, and Pam, he mentioned that you were talking about inspiring the next generation. So uh, thinking about, are there any gaps in student skills that we need to fill? But, but let's think about that first one. Where would you go to study aerospace engineering? Any thoughts, anyone? Yep, Colin. <laughs> I, I, I would, of course, have to say the, the James Watt School of Engineering uh, at the University of Glasgow, uh, who we've uh, had for, for, for many, many years had a, a degree program in aeronautical um, engineering. Um, that, that, that aside, I think for people who are interested in a career in space, um, what, what has changed, what has changed um, over the past 10, 15 years is in the past where graduates from a, any university uh, in Scotland, for example, who were interested in pursuing a career in space technology, uh, typically they would have to move away. Whereas now we see graduates from our own institution, others I'm sure across Scotland who are going working with companies such as Clyde Space and others and staying uh, within Scotland and contributing to the development and growth of the space sector in Scotland. I think, I think that's fantastic is to see uh, you know, people for, you know, young people with an interest in space at high school going through the higher education system in Scotland and then working in the Scottish space sector. Okay, uh, Malcolm, anything, I mean, particularly about experience that you could get whilst at school? Yeah, I mean, I think the, you know, I think, what I was going to say was, you know, we're talking about what makes Scotland an attractive place for the space sector and what differentiates us. And one of the things that comes up time and time again from the businesses that relocate here is actually the universities um, and the skills that come through. 
um, you know, Glasgow, Strathclyde, great engineering schools, Edinburgh with the geosciences, Stirling as well, Dundee. There, there, you know, there's a lot of universities producing very high quality graduates. And exactly like Colin was saying, you know, I, I moved away when I finished my PhD because there wasn't really the jobs here. Pam has stayed in Glasgow the whole time. She's been able to, to stay here um, and to work in the space sector that, that's grown up locally. And I think that is the, the important transition that we've seen. Uh, I mean, we are seeing as well the increased use of space in schools, We've got the Scottish Space School. Uh, you know, there's a whole range of different things. The UK Space Agency run programs to get school children thinking about how they can use space. Um, you know, so there's a lot of different things that you can do that goes right the way through the education sector from, you know, primary school right the way through to university. And now we're, you know, we're fortunate enough to have the jobs here in Scotland as well. Great. And, and then I'm thinking uh, either Pam or Sarah, because you're from the more applied end, but um, are there any gaps in students who are studied um, aerospace coming into the business? Do you notice there are any particular skills that are missing? I can go for this first if you like. Um, so I'm obviously we're obviously much more around the kind of data and applied data side of things and the kind of engineering aspect. Um, but I would I would sort of echo Malcolm's comments and there there is a huge amount of talent in Scotland, particularly around software engineers, data analysts, that sort of thing, where I think we as a company and perhaps even as a sector sometimes struggle is finding those people with well-rounded skills so you have incredibly technical scientific people who are incredibly incredible at sort of crunching the data and de developing those algorithms but they're not necessarily as well placed to to do the, the selling and the marketing and that sort of thing but typically it's still quite a, a sort of a science or a technical sell do you know we're not quite an off-the-shelf um service as of yet so you need those people who have the the kind of the, the business acumen and the skills to do that kind of front frontline um, services if you like but still with the technical capacity to almost translate all of the incredibly clever things that are happening upstream to the people who maybe don't necessarily have those skills at the, at the customer end okay I'm, I'm going to move on uh, to another question uh, partly because I already apologize I'm not going to be able to get through all of these questions there's a lot a lot of interest here but um, so here's a question from Paul Bentley, who's asking, will it be cheaper to use SpaceX reusable rockets or whether we will need our own spaceport in Scotland? What do you think? Yeah, Pam. Maybe maybe just a point to, to echo what Colin had said around the spaceport capability in Scotland. I think that kind of closes the loop on what's already a really strong ecosystem in the other areas of the value chain. And I think it's it's for someone like Clyde Space, it's not all about cost. And, you know, we, we have a number of customers with different requirements and cost isn't always the driver there. You know, there's there's time scales, particularly around launch, there's, there's quality, reliability, and, and all those things come into the picture when defining a, a service that's right for a given customer so I think what launch in Scotland gives us is the proximity to you know to having launch basically on your on your doorstep and not having to send engineers kind of halfway across the world to integrate satellites with launch vehicles you've got them by nature of having that on your doorstep a much closer relationship to help define future requirements and technology development and that collaboration that we have so well in other areas of the value chain, then feeding through to launch. So I think it's 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 not all about the cost, but I think having launch in Scotland gives us other areas of value. Okay, thank you for that. And uh, and just thinking, focusing in again on Scotland, can I ask you about? Um, you've talked a lot about Scotland's contribution in this in this area of research, and indeed and application. And if you look at the impact of the research um, in space science done in Scotland, bizarrely, well, it's number one in the world. I say bizarrely, not because that should surprise us. The volume might be small, but the quality is immense. So um, what does Scotland need to do in order to become a real world leader? And so that we are 
recognised on the global scene as, oh yeah, go to Scotland, that's where you're going to get the, the best people to work with us and, uh, you know, the, the greatest amount of innovation. Do we have to do anything in a joined up way about promoting ourselves because people might just see us as a, a small country? Yeah, Malcolm. I'll, I'll let Sarah answer it. She put her hand up. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Malcolm. Okay, Sarah, um, go for it. Yeah, I, I mean, I completely agree. I think the sector does need to come together and promote itself. I think it, it's, you know, the Scottish government say a lot that Scotland punches above our, above our weight. And I think it's important that we have a kind of a joined up vision. And I think that's really coming together. I mean, groups like SOX have been really important in bringing together the the sector and there's the space um, leadership group that Scottish Enterprise are running so I think it's really a case of pulling that all together and then also I think building some of those international partnerships and networks as well not, not we don't although we have a, a very strong and tight ecosystem I think those international networks can't be underestimated as well yeah um, so can, uh, here's a, a, a question from James Slaughter. Uh, the space industry is great at meeting business needs with space-based solutions, but what are the space industry's needs and what can we do to meet them? Any thoughts on that one? James, I don't think, uh, oh yeah, well done, Pam. Um, yeah, I think probably just tying that back into an earlier question, I think the space industry can benefit from this continued pool of talent coming out of, of local universities. So I think the space industry can benefit from those really close collaborations with university and, and technology development institutions. But I think really the space industry at large could benefit from more diversity yeah yeah great that we have we have that on the panel today but that's not broadly represented across the industry and I think we've still got a lot of work to do um, and I think that kind of goes back to your earlier question around how Scotland can be a world leader and I, I, I don't think unless we address that challenge adequately that we can really be a world leader in space, I think we need the diversity to, to continue to drive innovation. Okay, thank you. Um, I've got a question here from Callum Turner, uh, who's studying at ISAE Supero in Toulouse in France. And he was asking the question, how Scotland contributes to planetary science missions, which tend to be large international projects. So does Scotland get involved in that sort of space science? Yeah, Colin. Yeah, I can see a, a little bit about um, some work that's going on at the University of Glasgow on, on planetary exploration technologies. Um, as um, two, two of my colleagues, uh, Patrick Hartless and Kevin Worrell, uh, are just starting two uh, projects. One is uh, supported by the European Space Agency, and that's for, uh, for drilling uh, on Mars. So it's for developing uh, deep drilling technology to drill uh, deep within uh, subsurface of Mars from, from a rover. So um, there's work going on in certain Scotland on the, the underpinning technologies for, for planetary surface exploration uh, through uh, drilling, coring, um, uh, and, and related uh, space engineering. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so um, that's a slightly different question. Actually, Sarah, this, this one's for you. Uh, from Aravind Ravichandran, and um, who's asking, has there been work done in the past using satellite data to track the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals? Um, are there dashboards that use data from space, for example, to monitor uh, global country or regional levels that, that you're aware of? 
Yeah, so I think satellite technology and data has been used a huge amount across all uh, many of the sustainable development goals in terms of tracking them. Um, one thing I would say about the SDGs is that monitoring effort isn't particularly um, coordinated. So it tends to be that different countries are monitoring them either from their own national commitments looking internally, or all, but also from a kind of donor perspective. So what is the UK doing in terms of funding development in um, and support to the SDGs? But I think certainly Earth Observation lends itself very, very well to, to help monitor a lot of these. So obviously forestry would be a huge thing, things like water, impact on agriculture, which obviously feeds into poverty indicators. So I think the potential to use Earth Observation data for tracking the SDGs is great and a lot is being done, but I think more could be done in order to kind of coordinate those efforts. Okay, and who would you who would you see coordinating them? I mean, who would take that role? I mean, it's difficult. I mean, the SDGs are a UN led initiative and in theory they are kind of collating this information, but I think there is just so much to collate it's, it's quite difficult but um certainly ecometrica we're doing a lot in terms of different projects so one that i run called forest 2020 where we're supporting the life on land sustainable development goal and our whole kind of initiative is around improving the data available to support forest monitoring so it's kind of supporting countries to monitor their assets better but then also kind of report back on different policy initiatives that support the sdgs and initiatives like um you know reducing emissions from deforestation and degradation yeah. OK, so sort of following on from that kind of using space data, I've got a question here from Andrew Cauchy, who says, um, how can the increased adoption of space data across industries be encouraged? Because there are lots of perceived barriers, for example, high cost access to the data, you know, just getting involved in the data. So how does how does a standard industry um, think about getting access to that kind of space data. Malcolm, can it, you want to have a go at that? Yeah, well, I mean, this was really very much what we did within SOXA, was going out and speaking with people who weren't using space data and space service and understanding what their challenges were. And really the, the easiest way that we found to do it was just to sit down with them and ask what their top three or top five challenges were in the business. And don't expect them to understand anything about space. Just tell us what your challenges are, because ultimately they don't care where the service comes from. They've got a pain point in their business and they want it solved. They want it addressed and they just need the solution. So they don't care whether the data comes from space or it comes from somewhere else. So what we would try and do is sit down, understand their challenges, and then they will actually, okay, of those three, we can't help you with two of them, but we can help you with one of them. And here's how we can help with that one. And space would normally be a part of the solution. It's very rarely the full solution. And we would build up that kind of program and solution with them. But ultimately, a lot of the time, people don't need to understand where the service is coming from. A lot of the time, they don't care where the service is coming from. And that's one of the things, you know, Ecometrica do really well. They've got a great dashboard. It just tells their customers, here is the answer. They don't necessarily need to know where that answer has come from. So I think it's really, you know, it's up to the space sector to get out and talk with people who are not in the space sector, understand their challenges and build solutions for them. Okay, thanks, Malcolm. Sarah, you can pay Malcolm later for that good plug of Ecometrica. But, um, uh, so there's another, and this is a, a little bit like um, how, how you use space data again, but from Paul Bentley. So Paul's asking, can satellites track locust swarms that have been crossing Africa, for example, in the Middle East? And would that help fighting the issue? And um, yeah, so who, would, who can help me with that one? I can I can give it a go. <laughs> yeah, on you go. Yeah, so um, I've not seen any specific applications of tracking the locust swarms, but I know that sort of understanding um, where pests are is something that is, you know. What's the biggest and littlest sort of uh, level of resolution, Sarah? Sorry, I think you cut out a little bit there, Anne. I've oh. missed the beginning of your question. Uh, apologies, then I'll, I'll repeat the question. Um, so the question is from Paul Bentley, and he's asking, can satellites track locust swarms that have been crossing Africa and the Middle East? And, and I was just adding an extra question in on what is the resolution of satellite observation 
can they can they see me at the moment sitting in Edinburgh or not? <laughs> well, in terms of the sort of specifics of the the locust swarms that's happening at the moment, I don't know of kind of specific applications, although I'm sure there are many. But that whole idea of tracking and modelling pest outbreaks is definitely a huge area of research and application at the moment. So there are companies um, like a similar down in uh, Reading who are kind of looking to understand where pest breaks breakouts happening and also what what are the conditions that are kind of supporting that because also once you can understand what the drivers are you can perhaps support the the recovery and the solutions um as to the resolution of data i think i've i mean uh, others may have up, more up-to-date stats but i think at the moment the highest resolution you can get is something like 50 centimeters from a satellite but that's obviously the cost of that and using that on a regular basis can be quite prohibitive but the the data that you can get from the European Space Agency for free a sort of reasonable frequency goes down to 10 meter 10 square meters so you're able to get sort of reasonable resolution for useful frequency for for a low cost at the moment which is incredible it's a game changer really Okay, thank you. Now we've only got uh, two or three minutes of, of questions left so um so let me ask this one. Uh, with the announcement of a Scottish spaceport, how does our northerly latitude affect rocket mechanics and orbital potential? And it's an interesting question because one of the European spaceports is, is in French Guiana and Kourou, where I was lucky enough to see the first Sentinel satellite actually being launched into space, which is an unforgettable ex experience. And that's an equatorial spaceport and we're quite far to the north. So what's the difference? Uh, why is that significant? Colin, please help us. Yeah, I can give that one a go. Um, for launching from equatorial launch sites, we'll get you into an equatorial orbit around the Earth. So for example, for geostationary satellites used for telecommunications, uh, typically they're very large, heavy platforms, and so would use, for example, the Ariane rocket, um, as, as, as you've mentioned. Um, uh, launching from Scotland, launching north from Scotland, then gives you a trajectory which goes over the over the, the North Pole and would put you into polar orbit. And if you're in polar orbit, then the Earth is rotating underneath the satellite orbit plane. And so that would give you a continuous visibility of the entire globe as the satellite orbits around the poles and then the Earth rotates under the satellite orbit. So for uh, Earth observation satellites, for example, or for, for constellations of microsatellites, for communications or, or for imaging. Then launching north over the poles is the direction uh, you want to go. And in that case, uh, Scotland is, is very well placed geographically uh, for those types of missions. Okay, thank you, that's, that's really helpful. And this is probably our, our last question, but given it's the 4th of May, um, quite a good one to end on, I hope. So this is from Emily Finner, or Finer, I, I'm not sure the pronunciation. Do you see a role for science fiction in inspiring engagement with space technology or influencing design and innovation? Yeah, Malcolm. <laughs> I think, I, I mean, not so much do I see there has been a huge role of science fiction in the development of the space sector, going all the way back to Disney um, and guys like that, and actually getting some of the initial investment that happened in the States. And I think, you know, we continue to see a lot of influence in, um, you know, science fiction, leading science, um, and likewise feeding off of each other. Um, and I know a number of the people on the panel, you know, are, are readers of science fiction. And so I think there is a lot of interaction there between um, science fiction. And when you go back to the early days of the space sector, space is very visual, but we didn't have the pictures. So a lot of the artwork that was produced for science fiction was some of the things that really caught the public's imagination and then were able to release the, the investment and then went into the sector. Yeah. Any other thoughts on that value of science fiction? Okay, I, actually, I just from a, a very personal point of view, and um, maybe it's embarrassing to admit this, but I'm, I'm a big or was a big Star Trek fan. And certainly when I was very young and Star Trek was uh, first broadcast, and um, maybe you don't need to know the date, but it was 1966. And um, I used to sit and watch that with, uh, with my mother. And the interesting thing for me now, looking back at that, 
was how much technology, which was just imagination at the point of Star Trek, whether that be uh, Lieutenant Uhura with her communicator, whether it was looking at a screen, it's exactly what we're doing now, having a conference, but being able to meet with people who are all in different locations, having iPads or needleless injections, whatever it might be. We, it's almost as if the script writers uh, managed to imagine that technology and what we've done is now delivered that technology. So um, I, I suppose, and, and now I'm going to kind of move slightly into my concluding remarks and apologies, first of all, to all of those people who've sent in fantastic questions. Uh, if there is a, an option for the panelists to answer some of these questions offline, then I hope we can do that. Um, there's been a huge response for you because this has been such an interesting session. But I, I think it's, um, it's a really good example, space technology, of being able to harness the human imagination because all of us, uh, no matter where we are or what our circumstances are, can, can almost time travel simply by looking out at a night sky where you can travel back in time, looking at the light coming from stars and uh, even our own sun taking the time to, to travel to us. It's, it's a most fantastic thing and it unleashes our imagination and it, it seems to be a, a way of being able to capture all that imagination and creativity. And then hearing from our four speakers today, uh, it's made me even more excited, if that is possible, about space science, satellite technology, and how we can um, use that technology to understand our own planet and try and protect our own planet uh, a bit more effectively. But that it's almost become um, a, a democratic technology in that, in that every one of us benefits from uh, satellite technology uh, just during the day we take it for granted and often it's unseen uh, but the the opportunities are magnificent you you've highlighted in your questions a few areas about regulation uh, space debris um you know how, how scotland can make an impact in this and i would argue given scotland is the the most amazing research intensive nation and the impact of the research we do uh, relative to our GDP is number one in the world, um, which is quite amazing for a small country. But I think that uh, those of you who are listening uh, from the UK and further afield will see that this is um, an exciting place to be in this technology. And, and I think our speakers have, uh, have, have highlighted that enormously. So um, I think I want to just make a few thank yous before uh, we, we say goodbye. And uh, the first one is I, I want to thank the President of the Royal Academy of Engineering, Professor Sir Jim MacDonald, who joined us earlier and uh, who are our partners in hosting this uh, 2020 joint lecture between the Royal Society of Edinburgh and the Royal Academy of, of Engineering. I want to thank uh, our speakers, Malcolm, Sarah, Pam and Colin um, for the great intro video and also your good humour in answering a very varied set of questions. Um, and I, I think we've really enjoyed that. So thank, thank you very much for the time that you've taken. I, I want to thank the audience. We've, we've had over 160 people join this uh, Zoom webinar, um, which is quite something. It we can be seen again on the RSE's uh, YouTube channel and uh, with a slight delay, it will also be uh, broadcast on the Royal Academy of Engineering's YouTube channel as well. So uh, you can watch again and savor those answers um, in, the, uh, in your own time uh, later. And then I, I think the last thing that I, I want to do before a final message is just to thank the staff at the Royal Society of Edinburgh, in particular Steve Wilson, who's, who's managed to get this uh, webinar uh, up and running. And I hope, apart from my unstable internet connection, uh, it has worked very well for all of you listening uh, and participating. Uh, just before we sign off, it's to say to the audience that um, we would 
uh, ask that you you will you will receive an invitation to take part in uh, an evaluation of this event at the end of the event um, and you'll be directed to that evaluation which will be done on Mentimeter. It would be great if you can do that so that we can see what worked and what didn't work uh, in this event uh, because we look forward uh, with with the success so far of this one to doing many more of this and to, to bringing uh, exciting topics like this uh, to you wherever you are. So um, with that, uh, I'd like to thank you. I hope you all stay safe. Um, good afternoon and we'll see you again soon. Thank you very much indeed. Bye.